Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Bible 101 forum uh, for the Episcopal Church of Holy Communion. My name is Emily Walker Cornetta. I'm a seminarian serving at the church. Um, and we are going to talk in this week's Bible 101, or sorry, this month's Bible 101 forum about the Song of Songs. This was inspired by um, our Bible 101 forum last month, uh, where Reverend Mike led us in a conversation about um, kind of surprising depictions of sex and gender in the Bible, the sort of less talked about um, stories relating to sex and gender, uh, whereas the Song of Songs, of course, is perhaps, at least for me, probably the first text that I think about um, when I think of, of sex being mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and even so, though, I think, at least in my own experience, it's not a book that we talk a lot about in the American church. Um, and so building on our conversation last month, I thought um, that this would be sort of a fun opportunity to take uh, a sort of fresh look at the Song of Songs, um, a little bit at the text itself, but then also the kind of the various ways that Judaism and Christianity have um, sort of related to and interpreted this, uh, this sort of unusually sensual book in the biblical canon. Um, this will be a quick conversation, so a very, a very sort of glancing look at the text and the history of its interpretation. So here we go. I thought we'd start by just looking at a few excerpts uh, from the text itself. If you're like me, you're not necessarily sort of a regular reader of the Song of Songs. It might not be like particularly fresh in your mind. Um, so I thought we'd start by looking at some of the language uh, of the text and um, just to sort of re-familiarize ourselves with it. Um, and then also talk a little bit about how these um, sort of what features of the, of the text itself of the book are highlighted in these various passages. So first from chapter one, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is perfume poured out. Therefore the maidens love you. Draw me after you, let us make haste. So we hear these are the first verses of the song and immediately we get number one, the woman's voice who is the, um, you know, the female lover in this sort of amorous dialogue uh, between the lovers, that, uh, between the two of them, the female voice is the sort of dominant one in the song and it's her voice that begins. Um, and we hear this, all this, this urgency that also sort of pervades the song, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, draw me after you, let us make haste. And also we get all this allegorical sort of sens sensual language, wine, oils, perfume. We'll see more of that as we go on. Uh, from chapter two, my beloved speaks and says to me, this is the female lover speaking uh, again. My, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. Our vineyards are in blossom. So we see here the, um, the sort of organic unity in, in the song between, um, between human bodies and the love uh, between human bodies and the earth. Um, comparisons between um, you know, our, our vineyards being in blossom and the vineyards of our love being in blossom. Um, the state of the sort of um, the, the lovers, um, sort of unity and relationship and the state of the earth, the rain, the winter is past, the rain is, is gone, it's time for our love. So this sort of interplay between the land and the earth and sort of what is happening um, uh, in this sort of natural environment in the natural world and what is happening uh, with and between the lovers is also a theme that we see uh, throughout the song. And then this third one, my beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mountains. So here we have, again, the, um, the female lover being, again, quite sort of directive and, um, and direct about her desires. You know, she's saying to the, um, to the male lover, uh, come and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mouth. She's sort of directing him. Um, and I think several um, sort of 
scholars or interpreters that I read see this as a um, at this this language of uh, be a gazelle or a young steff, a young stag on the cleft mountains as a not so indirect or even not even so subtle allusion to the sex act itself, um, which is something that we also see a lot in the Song of Songs. Um, I think we'll see it again maybe in the next um, in the next uh, passage that we look at, but this sort of um, this sort of dual meaning of the of the words like we could be talking about the natural world or we could be talking about like sort of a specific sexual act between two lovers are we talking about one or the other we're talking about both usually probably both so there's all this sort of um, erotic allusion um, in the texts that are sometimes a little bit obscured I think in some of our contemporary translations but probably certainly were not lost on um, you know the hearers of the of the song in its own context. So here's from chapter seven, uh, another excerpt. How graceful are your feet in sand sandals, O queenly maiden. And we see here this, so now this is the male lover talking and he is, um, as we'll see, starts, he's sort of praising the features of, of his lover and he, talk, he starts with her feet and then moves upwards, upwards, upwards from her feet to her head. So how graceful are your feet in sandals, O queenly maiden. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Um, it's been pointed out to me uh, sort of most recently by a, um, a professor of Hebrew Bible at Union um, that though this is in many modern English translations translated navel, that it's really um, in the Hebrew, it's a bowl. He's referring to a bowl of mixed wine. And given that he's going from her feet to her head, navel is probably not uh, the part of, of her body he's alluding to here. Um, so your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools and that continues, continues. And then later, you are stately as a palm tree and your breasts are like its clusters. Sorry, one second, my screen share was interrupted here. One moment. Okay, apologies. Uh, you're stately as a palm tree and your breasts are like its clusters. I say, I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples and your kisses like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. So here this very evocative language um, about kisses and also this sort um, you know, a sort of pretty, ex somewhat explicitly, somewhat hidden, but uh, praising and depiction of the lover's body in all of its parts. And then one last excerpt. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come my beloved, let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early in the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened, and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Again, this sort of lovely unity and integration of um, the sort of opening budding natural world and the opening budding of um, the love between these, these two people. So as we talk a little bit more about the text of the Song of Songs and also look very briefly at um, some of the ways it's been interpreted throughout time, I'm gonna use as a, as a guide, as a sort of primary guide, um, this book uh, that was published just uh, a couple of years ago um, by Ilana Pardes. She's a professor at the Compar of comparative liter literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She wrote this book, The Song of Songs, a biography, um, writing a biography of a text is so was just like uh, sort of wonderful and delightful. Um, but she talks in the book about, again, the sort of many, many centuries long life that this book has had in different um, periods and different cultural contexts. Um, and I will be very much um, gleaning from and using her, her insights in the history she writes in this um, short pre presentation. So first, um, 
a few features of the of the text overall just to talk about in sort of a sum, summary way. Um, so the song, this is part as language here that I'm using at the beginning. She talks about the song as a dream zone where nothing is completely discernible and everything in the song, it's poetry after all, is deeply felt. We move with unparalleled speed from one metaphor to another, from one sight to another with no distinctions between inside and outside, no temporal transitions and no need for explanations. Just very sort of associative, fast moving, evocative. A downpour of imperatives in the psalm or in the song. We already saw this. Um, come away with me, make haste. They sort of impel the reader, the, the person who's reading the poetry, like come join, come on, join the wild pace of love. In the song, all the senses are invoked, tastes, colors, sounds, perfumes, and sexual desire and sexual experience is, is spelled out with verve. Also, as we talked a little bit about already, the natural, the natural beauty of the world around the lovers, it reflects their love. Blossoming flowers, fruit-laden trees, singing birds. The world is depicted as a paradise. Uh, and that is reflective of the paradise that the lovers experience with one another. A few more features of the text. Um, it's been pointed out that the dialogue between the, the, the two lovers is strikingly egalitarian. Uh, biblical scholar Rob, Robert Alter um, points, points it out this way. He says, it's only in the Song of Songs, and here he's talking about the, the sort of biblical canon. It's only in the Song of Songs that there's no one giving instruction or exhortation, there's no leader. Instead, they're two, the voices of two lovers praising each other, yearning for each other, pro-offering invitations to enjoy. The story, if you can even sort of call it that, is fragmentary. There's no discernible plot or line of action or narrative in the Song of Songs. Most scholars define it today as a sort of, as an anthology of of love poem, of ancient love poems, shaped by many hands over many centuries. And in this sort of patchwork of, um, of ancient love poems, there's this, you, you find a dynamic between longing and consummation. Um, of note, the text does not say that they are married. The, um, the male lover does sometimes use the language of my bride, but it's, um, still unclear whether they're betrothed or married. Um, there is a lot of sneaking around. Um, so the, the overall picture seems to be that they are not married. Um, and another feature of the text is that, um, as we've said already, that the woman uh, between the two is the one who most forcefully voices and embodies amorous longing in the poems. So I want to talk briefly too about the question of canonization. Um, because reading the song, one might wonder how did an erotic poem with or a, a collection of a sort of edited collection of erotic poems with no reference to God or no national history, there's no mention of Israel in the poem in the poems. How did it end up in the Bible? Uh, that's uh, like a sort of million dollar question question turns out we no one knows for sure. Um, there does seem to have been a rabbinic debate about its place in the biblical canon, the only surviving remnant of which is um, a saying of Rabbi Akiva that we have uh, preserved, where he, he said, the whole world is not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the writings are holy, and the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. So he's sort of playing on the Song of Songs, Shir Hasharim, and the Holy of Holies, Kodesh Kodeshim. The Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. He's really arguing, so one can infer that there were people arguing otherwise, that perhaps the Song of Songs wasn't so holy. Um, you have Rabbi Akiva saying, no, 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 this is among the holiest of the writings that we were given. Also, Rabbi Akiva, um, from his sayings, we can infer that the song was quite popular in not religious settings. Um, he, had, he has said, he who trills his voice in chanting the Song of Songs in the banquet house and treats it as a sort of song has no part in the world to come. And the fact that Rabbi Akiva needed to um, 
sort of condemn the singing of this poetry in the banquet house. So in like pubs, um, places where wine was being consumed. Um, the fact that he felt the need to condemn it meant that probably it was being done. Um, so clearly, you know, again, we can sort of infer that the song, these, these poems were very popular um, and, you know, in, in like festive and not religious settings. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of interpretation um, of the Song of Songs. And probably, as you all know, um, really allegory, interpreting the whole, the, the whole book as an allegory um, has really been throughout history, perhaps the most sort of prominent and predominant interpretation of the, of the song. Um, we can see here as an example, this is a, an image uh, from the 12th century um, at the, this image sort of opened the text of the, of the a manuscript of the Song of Songs. And it's a, um, in the picture we find Christ and the church kissing um, as a prevalent allegorical interpretation of, of the song. Here's two um, ancient allegorical readings. We'll see that this um, the allegorical interpretations really predominated in, in ancient times throughout um, the you know th sort of throughout medieval times as well. Um, but here's a couple ancient examples. The first um, uh, midrashic example: uh, Your breasts are like two fawns. This is from Song of Songs seven four. Um, here the rabbi says, this refers to Moses and Aaron. Just as a woman's breasts are her glory and her ornament, so Moses and Aaron are the glory and the ornament of Israel. Just as a woman's breasts are her charm, so Moses and Aaron are the charm of Israel. Just as a woman's breasts are full of milk, so Moses and Aaron are full of Torah. And then we have origin, um, the, the sort of the Christian father, I think, fourth century, I believe, maybe third. Um, he says in reference to song, song of Songs, uh, chapter one, verse three, thy name is as perfume poured forth. Origen wrote, these words foretell a mystery. Even so comes the name of Jesus to the world and is as perfume poured forth when it is proclaimed. Particularly in the, um, in the history of Christian interpretation of the Song of Songs, Origen, um, who wrote like a, I think a like a long commentary on allegorical commentary on the Song of Songs, um, comparing the the two lovers to Christ and the Church, really um, really set the tone for Christian interpretation for many centuries to come. So we have um, another uh, prominent interpreter of the Song of Songs, Teresa of Avila, uh, who lived in the 16th century. She was the first woman to record her meditations on the Song of Songs, first woman that we know of. And um, her, the commentary that she wrote or the meditation that she wrote uh, evoked a hostile response from the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which ordered her to burn her commentary, uh, which she did. Uh, however, the nuns um, in the convent in which she lived preserved a copy, uh, one manuscript, which is how we have it today. Um, the meditations that she wrote about the Song of Songs were very personal. Uh, her marveling at the joy and the consolation of divine intimacy, and she cast herself in the role of the woman protagonist, and the nuns um, among whom she lived as the daughters of Jerusalem, the sort of um, the, the women with whom the lover in the Song of Songs is in dialogue, and um, with whom she shares the pleasures and pains of being lovesick, and she calls them uh, to join her in the amorous pursuit of God. We see her on the right, a, um, a well-known statue of um, Teresa of Avila from the 16th century, maybe early 17th century, um, in which she has an angel is visiting her and stabbing her with a, um, with a sword of love, I think, um, a spear of love. Um, and you can see the sort of mix of joy, this sort of mix of joy and pain and the, um, the sort of coming together of the bodily and the spiritual in her uh, intense encounter with this angel. Another uh, well-known commentator on the Song of Songs, um, a couple centuries, or no, five centuries uh, before Teresa of Avila was St. Bernard de Clairvaux. 
um, he, wrote, he wrote this about the song. Of what use to me is the wordy effusions of the prophets? Rather let him who is the most handsome of the sons of men, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Even the very beauty of the angels can only leave me wearied, for my Jesus utterly surpasses these in his majesty and splendor. Therefore I ask of him what I ask of me, neither man nor angel, that he kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Um, following, um, following Stephen Moore, who is a um, professor of New Testament at uh, Drew University, he, he wrote an article um, called Song of Songs in the History of Sexuality and argued that here he talked about St. Bernard de Clairvaux, um, Origen himself, um, Origen wrote also uh, that of in his writing on the Song of Songs cast himself also in the position of the female lover um, and of God, talked of God's hand, God's left hand is under my head and his right hand will embrace me. He sort of, um, again, was imagining God in embracing him and his his soul within him as the sort of uh, feminine of the lovers. Anyway, Stephen Moore talks about this. Um, these allegorical readings, I think, sometimes have um, been thought of as discourses of sexual repression, like, oh, these sort of ancient and medieval readers of the text didn't want to sort of acknowledge the, uh, the blatantly sort of sexual erotic nature of the, of the readings and therefore allegorized it. Um, but as Moore argues that these are actually, they're not discourses of these allegorical or allegorical readings are not discourses of sexual repression, but rather discourses of sexual expression, often deviant sexual expression, um, like the, these allegorical readings uh, between Christ and um, a sort of individual, Christ and the church, um, often end up in readings that, you know, um, are sort of interpretations that relate the male interpreter, uh, the man, in a um, sort of in this sort of erotic relationship with God, who is also gendered as male, um, and then we saw with um, Teresa of Avila too that uh, her sort of um, as a woman, her uh, putting herself um, in the role of sort of commentator and interpreter and um, expressing her own uh, sort of intimate connection to this. Um, uh, to a relationship with God that was very sensual and embodied, how that was um, uh, unconventional uh, for medieval gender roles in a way that sort of got her in trouble with the Spanish Inquisition. So um, there is uh, certainly in terms of gender and sexuality, some kind of uh, deviant stuff going on here, even, even as the um, allegorical interpretations are being uh, taking precedent over the more sort of uh, literal reading of the text. But then in the Enlightenment and afterwards, um, the sort of more plain or literal reading comes to take priority over the allegorical reading. And more recently, um, there have been some uh, interesting modern takes on the, on the Song of Songs. Um, in, the, in the 80s, I think, Phyllis Tribble, who is a um, well-known feminist biblical scholar uh, praised the Song of Songs for um, the dominance of the woman's voice in the narrative, um, for, the, for its celebration of female desire, and also for this dynamic of mutuality between the two lovers rather than hierarchy. Um, more recently, Will Gaffney, who is a, a Episcopal priest um, and a Hebrew, um, uh, a Hebrew Bible scholar, she um, has brought a, a, a womanist perspective to the Song of Songs and glor just has really lifted up that the female lover um, in, the, in the song is just glories in the beauty of blackness and has, has lifted up the song as um, really uh, celebrating the love between two black bodies and this being scripture and revelation um, in the in the, in our tradition um, and there also have been in the past couple of decades some poetic translations that have have come out of the song of songs and i thought reading the one of these might be a um, a nice way to end um, one of the 
poetic translations that's come out um, in the past couple of decades has been by Marsha Falk. Um, and here is her rendition of um, a few verses from chapter seven. Turning to him who meets me with desire. Come love, let us go out to the open fields and spend our night lying where the henna blooms, rising early to leave for the near vineyards where the vines flower, opening tender buds and the pomegranate boughs unfold their blossoms. There among blossom and vine, I will give you my love, musk of the violet mandrakes spilled upon us and returning, finding our doorways piled with fruits, the best of the new picked and the long stored. My love, I will give you all I have saved for you. So I think whether we um, read this, these poetic texts allegorically or literally or both the song as, as a book in the Bible, the Song of Songs is an invitation to experience something of God as a, um, like as a scorching fire, God in erotic longing, God in consummation, God in the poetic and the organic unity between our bodies and the natural world. And as I was, um, you know, preparing this forum, I realized that this, um, I didn't plan it this way, but the Song of Songs is, I think, an especially appropriate book for springtime and perhaps even also for the Easter season, because there's, there's pain and suffering and absence in the song, but also, and I think so much more so, there's a surrender to delight and to joy and to ecstasy, um, even ecstasy. So as we see the world blossoming around us uh, here in St. Louis, with flowers bursting forth everywhere we look. I think the song, this Song of Songs invites us to, to join in this, um, in this celebration. So thanks for joining me in this like very speedy take on the Song of Songs. I look forward to having a conversation with some of you about your own thoughts about this book of the Bible uh, in a few days time. Thank you.